Amen. It is so good to see you this morning. Thank you for being in the house of God. And uh, Mark is a book of action. Now, let me just mention this. For those of you uh, that are following the Lord and believers' baptism today, if you did not already meet with Pastor Josh about that, when we give the invitation and we invite people to come forward uh, to respond for the invitation, that is your cue to be able to go through these back doors and you're going to go upstairs to the changing room. So if you missed that important meeting, you'll catch Pastor Josh up there right at the close of the service. And I love seeing a full house. When the choir came down, there's not very many empty seats. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, I'm just glad that you're here this morning. But Mark is a book of action. Maybe my parents named me that uh, because they read the book of Mark. I don't know. But, uh, but I can tell you, a lot happens in chapter number 10. Now, uh, really, the, 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 the key to our sermon is going to happen about halfway through the chapter. And you understand, when we're preaching expositionally, you can't preach every portion of the chapter. There's just no way. We don't have enough time. And, uh, and besides all that, I'm not John MacArthur. And so I can't go line by line and verse by verse and word by word and even comma by comma uh, as good as he can. But I can tell you this, there's some awesome stuff that goes on here in in, in, uh, Mark chapter number 10. So it really starts out with a subject that makes people angry, it makes people cringe, and even makes some people cry. And this is the Pharisees. They're always trying to trip up Jesus. They're always trying to get Jesus to make a mistake. They're always trying to confuse the Savior. But you, you, you can't confuse the one that wrote the law, right? I mean, he, he is the law. He is the word. So therefore, uh, he doesn't have to remember what he said he, because that embodies him. He, he is that. And so Jesus answers this question. And, and I mean, it, 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 it kind of confuses him for a minute. And, and, and it really kind of just gets them off target, really. But he answers this question about divorce. And I know this is a question that a lot of times pastors avoid and don't want to talk about, but I believe in preaching the whole counsel of the word of God. So if it talks about giving, we're going to talk about giving. If it talks about living moral and clean and pure, we're going to talk about that. If it talks about salvation by Christ alone, through faith alone, in other words, sincerity doesn't get you to heaven, you can be so sincere that you blow yourself up, but that's not going to get you to heaven if you don't have your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we will always try to preach the truth, but the Bible also says something about this, so we need to talk about it today. So if you would stand to your feet out of respect for the reading of God's word, and uh, I, I, I love for you to be able to just, us to be able to kind of absorb this. We're gonna read several verses, and then uh, I'll pray and you can be seated. Here's what the Bible says. Verse number two, and the Pharisees came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? And they were tempting him. And he answers and said unto them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. Now, now remember back when we did the Ten Commandments series? That was one of my favorite series we've ever done uh, and I've ever preached. I remember how in the Old Testament it was thou shalt not murder. But in the New Testament, Jesus said, if you even hate somebody, you've murdered. In In the Old Testament, it was don't commit adultery. But in the New Testament, Jesus said, if you even look on a woman and lust after her. Well, Jesus, again, is ratcheting up the law. And he says this. He says, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Hey, let me read that again. Maybe everybody on Facebook will get this too. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female, right? So we're one or the other. And for this cause, shall a man leave his mother and his father and cleave to his wife? They too shall be one flesh. So they shall be no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And in the house, his disciples asked him again the same matter. His disciples said, Lord, we need some clarification on this. And he said unto them, whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And a woman shall put away her husband and shall be married to another. She committeth adultery. Now watch this. Remember last chapter, how Jesus dealt with the children? He does it again. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them and his disciples rebuked them that brought them but when Jesus saw it he was much displeased he was angry and he said unto them suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of God verily I say unto you whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall not enter therein and he took them up in his arms and he put his hands on them and he blessed them now look at verse number 17 and when he was gone forth into the way there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him Good master, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? Jesus saith unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. 
Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy mother and thy father. And he said unto him, Master, all of these I have observed or kept from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. God, I pray that as we deal with some of the most important issues in life that we face, God, that you would just give us clarity. Lord, I pray that you would give us your spirit. And Lord, I pray that we would know, Lord, that your word has clearly defined for us the path that we should take. Lord, if there's someone here today that does not know you, I pray that you would speak to their heart. If there's someone here today that needs a fresh touch, a fresh anointing from you, Lord, I pray that they would receive it today. Lord, if there's even someone here today that needs healing of spirit or even healing in body, Lord, I pray that they would come to you and faith and they would pray so that they could experience that today. All this we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. So they start out with a sticky question. I mean, they jump right in here and they say, now, what is, what, what, Lord, what, what should happen with this thing of divorce? How should this take place? And, and so Jesus asked them a question. He said, so what, what did Moses say? And they said, well, Moses said we can do it. And so here's what he said. He said, okay. He said, uh, yes, you can do that, but it's not what I prefer. It's not what I want, but it's only because of the hardness of your heart. So how does God feel about that? You see, subjects like this sometimes get so near and dear to our heart that we don't like to deal with them because we care about how we feel. But can I just say this? At the end of the day, it's how God feels. And it's what God's word says. Well, Pastor Mark, you don't understand my circumstances. Pastor Mark, you don't understand my life. I get that, I don't, but he does. The word of God is written to be clear for us and is our final authority. And all of us have been touched by this in some way. In fact, I grew up in a preacher's home and one of my brothers uh, who married a a pastor's daughter uh, just a few years into marriage, his marriage separated and broke up. And and let me just say this, it is a painful thing and and, and it affects a lot of people. But let me say this first and foremost for all of you at Highview Baptist Church at Valley Station, being divorced does not make you second class, not here or with God. That's not a very good amen. But if they don't want to amen you, I will. Does not make you second class because mistakes are mistakes. Now, some mistakes have a greater penalty. Some mistakes have a higher price tag. Some mistakes cost us longer. Are are you with me? I mean, if I get drunk and drive a car down the interstate, go in the wrong direction and hit somebody and kill them, that is a, a, a foolish, foolish decision, but it may cost me prison time. But that's a little bit different than, than leaving the turkey on a little too long and burning it for Thanksgiving dinner. My wife did not do that. A little bit different. So we find this sticky question gets a scriptural answer in verses three through eight. And this is where God's word is clear. He's clear in two places. He's clear in the gospel of Matthew chapter five. He's also clear when in Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter number six and seven. And that is this, divorce is allowable for two cases. Adultery or abandonment? That, that is when God says it's, it's okay. Unfaithfulness, immorality, adultery. And, and, and by the way, I think when, when, when they're teaching on this, even in this case, it is not like the, the Lord says, okay, well, you're just free to go do whatever you want now. No, he, he says forgive first because if we have bitterness in our heart, the Bible says we're to forgive, forgive others even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. In fact, if we're unforgiving towards that one who's wronged us, We need to be right with them before we ever consider anything else because we can't be right with God till we're right with others. We've gotta be right here before we can be right here. And so Jesus gives just a clear answer and he kind of lets the chips fall where they they may. And then we find this strict interpretation. Verses nine through 12, he says, don't do it. Try to make it work. So there's several people here today, and this is just the introduction of the sermon because I'm I'm working through the the three pieces here. But in this first piece, I want you to think about something. If you're struggling in your marriage today, get help. Go to your community group leader. Come to one of your pastors. Come to Pastor Josh. Come to Pastor Luke. Come to myself. Get help. 
don't go to your friend at work that's been divorced 19 times. Just divorce the bum. Yeah, she's real happy. Am I right? Make sure you're going to somebody who says, hey, I mean, when we got married, it was till death do us part. I told Kim, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. I mean, if you move, I'm moving. I mean, we, we are in this thing for good. No, so if you're struggling, extend forgiveness. Even if you've been wounded, even if you've been hurt, extend forgiveness. Don't give up. Don't give up. You say, well, I'm the only one that's trying. I, I think about our salvation relationship, Pastor Luke. We were dead in our trespasses and sins and Jesus was the only one that was trying. And we're to be like Jesus. We're to be like Christ. You say, well, they're, they're not giving it any effort. They're not, they're not trying. Go get some help. If you're struggling, God wants your marriage to make it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good place to give applause. Do you, you know why? <clears throat> the divorce rate, Pastor Harvey, in the church is now almost the same as in the world. In fact, the only difference really is in the world, more people live together and they don't get married. The breakup rate is higher in the world, but divorce itself is almost as high in evangelical churches. It's over 50% now. That means half. Don't make it. So if you're divorced today, don't be bitter. Don't let this event define who you are in Christ. Don't let this keep you defeated. Strive through the power of Christ to live for him and develop a strong home if you're having to be both mom and dad or dad and mom. If you're in an abusive marriage or abusive relationship, come to one of your pastors, contact the authorities, talk to Brother Dale and our security team. This, I, I, this betrays the marriage vows. And not only that, I want you to understand this. If you are being abused, no matter what the abuser says, this is not your fault. It's not your fault. Get help. And you say, well, I, I am afraid. I, I'm afraid. We will help you. We will help you. I'll, I'll never forget. I, this isn't in my notes. But, but don't be this person. My, my daughter and I, she was about three. We were knocking on doors in a, in a, in a trailer court. And uh, all of a sudden, the door of this, this mobile home busts open. And uh, Nate, <clears throat> this little woman, about 90 pounds, gets thrown out in the yard. And this guy is just beating on her. So I tell Kenzie, go to the car. So, I mean, I do what you should do. I start beating on him. <laughs> that just makes a lot of sense. I mean, you don't, you don't beat a woman. I'm, I'm living proof that I never raised my voice and screamed or touched my mother. I was raised that way. I, 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 I mean, I wouldn't be here if I had. So, <clears throat> so about that time, this woman gets out and goes, and you know, I'm like, dial 911. She starts grabbing me by the shirt going, he's really nice when he's not drinking. Ladies, that is not the relationship you need to be living in. And that's not the relationship you need to be raising your children in. God has answers and we have help for you. We wanna help you. We have ladies in our church who have been through those relationships in the past, who are not in those relationships now, who have been delivered from that, who can help you, who want to help you. So this is not a marriage issue, this is a heart issue. Number four, in a godly marriage, if you're in a godly marriage today, let, let me give you some things to stay married, stay in church. Time Life Magazine, not a, not a Christian organization, Time Life Magazine said you are 200 times less likely to end up in divorce if you attend church one time a week. 200 times just by attending church. It, it, we should be attending church for a lot of other reasons, but your marriage needs the house of God. And by the way, if you have a successful marriage, Satan is after you because the thief cometh not but forth to steal and to kill and to destroy and he wants to wreck your home. And if you have a good marriage, think about how many marriages he can bring down around you if he gets yours. You're like a 10 point buck. I've been deer hunting all year. Everybody's killed deer except me. Okay, praise the Lord. Eddie can't kill deer either. So <clears throat> season's over. So... Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding, just kidding. I've had a lot of little bucks come by, but I'm not looking for a little buck. I'm looking for a big buck. I'm targeting the big ones. Guess who Satan tries to target in our church? Key homes, 
key families. And when he brings that one down, he brings down three or four others around him. So you need to be on guard. You need to be sober and be vigilant because the adversary of the devil walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Focus on your marriage, make it a priority, have a date night, spend time with your wife. Now, if you're single, be godly. Don't look for the right mate, be the right mate. That was really good. (laughs) Somebody tweet that. Listen, stay pure. Purity is not old fashioned. The, The Bible still says whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Don't shack up. What got, thanks, Luke. You stayed with me. <laughs> got Luke. Only Luke is with me. I think that's what Paul said. Don't live together. It's not a test drive. I, I don't go to Walmart and get out toothbrushes and try them and then stick them back in. <laughs> God leads you to the right one. Stay pure. Live pure. Make sure your minds are staying pure. And then you'll have a godly marriage. And I can look back over 20 years plus years with my wife and my kids and I can thank God for what he's done in our life. So that's the first part. It just gets better. Some of you, "Ah, now I'm gonna talk about tithing. No, I'm kidding, I'm not. It's the only way I could make the rest of you mad. Now, number two, Jesus then talks about children again. Did you know that today we have, Pastor Luke, like 80 plus people that are not in this building but are over there having church do you know at, at, at number one we couldn't fit 80 people in here if we tried to we, we, we couldn't fit them in the building but, but but can I just say this children are important in fact the Bible says they're a heritage to the Lord it and, and it makes me so mad anytime a preacher says this well hey we had seven or eight saved today well how many of them were kids don't ever say that to me my my, my level gets extreme quick well Actually, the kids have more life left to live for God than you do because you're half dead. You've, you've burned half of it, right? I mean, if, if you're 40 years old, you've wasted 40 years, you can't get back. But when an eight or nine or 10 year old gives their life to Christ, then they have their whole life ahead of them. I mean, that's what we're looking for. And by the way, did you know that 90% of people accept Christ under the age of 18? If you accepted Christ above that, you're not the, the norm. You're, you're, you're a little abnormal. It's been a few of you here, but praise the Lord, you still got in the family, amen? Better late than never. We'll still, you're that weird uncle in the family here at, at church, but we, we still love you. Now, now get this, children are important. Loving them is important. But then we have the saddest part to this whole expose. The saddest part to the story we read today is this decision time for this young man. Can I, can I tell you this? Life is full of decisions. Uh, where you're going to go to college, my daughter is getting all these stinking uh, things about, about going to college and, and, and all these colleges are trying to recruit her. Where you get your haircut? Don't say anything about my haircut. I know this is the worst haircut I've ever had in my life. I went to a new barber and tried. It, don't ever, you know, where you get your haircut is important. Don't try to break in a new barber. Sometimes it just don't turn out. Are y'all with me? Even little decisions, they're important. Now, like Luke, he doesn't need, he gets his literal hair cut, <laughs> not hairs, but, um, so you don't have to worry about it. But, <clears throat> but for the rest of us with these full, luscious heads of hair, where we go to the barber, what we drive, where we go to church, what we're gonna eat, whether we're gonna read our Bible or not, what we're gonna look at, what we're gonna do today. We, we make decisions every day, but the biggest decision you'll ever make, we find it in Matthew where, 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 where Pilate said, what then shall you do with this one called Christ? The biggest decision that you'll ever make is what you'll do with Jesus. And this rich young ruler, as we have called him uh, throughout time, this rich young ruler made a bad choice, made a very poor choice. In fact, we find him coming to Christ and we find the Lord speaking to him, but he never comes again, never comes again to the Lord. God never maybe even gives him another chance, I don't know. But I find here that he was under serious conviction. I mean, it was, it was, it was very serious because in, in verse number 17, when we, we read, it said that he ran to Jesus and he fell on his face and he said, Lord, what do I have to do to go to heaven? That sounds pretty serious. 
I've been here in this service where people have come down this aisle and flooded this altar and accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. They were serious, but this young man, he was very serious about what he was doing. John 6, says, no man can come to me except the father which has sent me, draw him. John, 5, uh, John 6, 37 says, all that the father giveth me shall come to me and him that cometh to me I'll in no wise cast out. There is no coming to Jesus without being drawn by the Holy Spirit of God. I believe in that old fashioned, no conviction, no conversion, salvation. There has to be a drawing. I believe in a whosoever will gospel, but I do not believe in a whensoever will gospel. I believe the Holy Spirit of God has to be working. Dr. Percy Ray, one of the godliest men that ever lived, said this, the most dangerous thing a sinner can do is reject Christ to the point to where he then rejects you. You're not rejecting a denomination today if you don't come to Christ. You're not rejecting this preacher today, but you're rejecting God Almighty and his free gift of salvation that he's offered you. And that's what this young man turned down. D.L. Moody was called to the bedside of a man who was about to die. He had witnessed to this man many times and he thought he was gonna get saved. Nate, he pulled out his Bible and he got beside his bed and he said, will you call on Christ? And here's what he said. He said, in life I wanted him not and in death he wants me not. Esau had said, wept with bitter tears for repentance, but he found none. C.H. Spurgeon said, there is no judgment of God that is so severe, yet so just as for God to leave a sinner. If he's convicting your heart today about where you're gonna spend eternity, today is the day of salvation. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He was under severe conviction, serious conviction. But number two, he claimed to keep strict commandments. He claimed he kept them all. Has anybody kept all the commandments other than Jesus? No. What about the greatest born among women? Who was the greatest born among women? John the Baptist, right? That's what Jesus said. Jesus said he was, <clears throat> when he was in prison, Luke, he started doubting his salvation. Pastor Aaron, he even sent his disciples and said, are you even here? Do we look for another? I mean, he, he didn't even know where he was at. You say, well, how do we handle that? How do, we, how do we make that make sense in our mind? Well, the Bible says this, there's none righteous, no, not one. He says all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. He says all of our righteousness, it's as, as filthy rags. I fear for you if you're still sinning and it just don't bother you anymore. He claimed that he kept the commandments. Here's what I believe happened. I believe he got so used to breaking the commandments that they didn't bother him anymore. In fact, the Bible has a terminology for this and has a passage for this. In 1 Timothy 4, 2, it says, being seared as with a hot iron. And in Ephesians chapter four, it says, being beyond feeling. L let me give you this. When I was in the military, we fast roped out of helicopters. And you, you grab all your stuff and you grab hold of this helicopter and you slide down this rope. It's about that big around slid out of the back of Chinooks and I've slid out of the back of, <clears throat> or off, off the side of uh, uh, UH-60s, Blackhawks. And you have these thick gloves on. But if you slide too far, too fast, those gloves will get hot. And if you, after you spend a, a, a 10 days, the toughest 10 days at the Army at Air Assault School, uh, at Sabalewski Air Assault School at, 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 in the 101st Airborne down at Fort Campbell, after you've done that so many times and your hands have got hot so many times, they become calloused. They got so burned, Brother Chris, that you could take a needle and just stick it in my finger or in my hand on the calluses and I couldn't feel it because I've done it over and over and over. There's probably some of you here that the first time you got involved in pornography or some kind of sin, habitual sin in your life, it bothered you, you knew it was wrong. But you've done it to the point it doesn't bother you anymore. You know what, just because you feel like it's not wrong, doesn't mean it's not wrong. You see, I don't believe that this man was perfect. I just believe that this man looked at his life and maybe compared himself to others and thought, I'm doing pretty good. I'm gonna be okay. And he loved his sin more than he loved the Savior. But then number three, he had to make a specific choice. Jesus loved him. For God so loved the world. Jesus loved him. The passage says that Jesus loved him but he had an idol. He had a choice. 
He had something that was more important. And in this case, it was money. Money is not wrong, but the love of money is wrong. In fact, the Bible says no man can serve two masters. He'll love one, he'll hate the other, he'll hold one, he'll despise the other, but you can't serve God and what? Money, mammon. It's a problem. What do you really love? Does this get more time than God every day? Uh, my, my, my phone, uh, when I pull it up, it shows my screen time, what I do every day, screen time. <clears throat> and so it shows social networking, reading and reference, productivity, banking, shows, shows what I do every day on my phone. <clears throat> if your social networking is four hours and 25 minutes on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and your time in the faith book is zero, you love that more than God. Amen, Brother Mark. Boy, you just keep going. I know it's tough, but we don't want you to quit today. We want you to just keep preaching. When your checkbook has everything in it, and no High View Baptist Church? What do you love? And you don't have to be rich to love money. I know poor people that are greedy. I mean, they, they, I mean, they are the greediest people you've ever seen in your life. They're so tight. They put a, 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 a slice of cheese in their pocket and buy, uh, well, instead of buying a cheeseburger at McDonald's, they'll buy a hamburger and take cheese from home to try to save money. How much time do you spend talking on the phone versus prayer? How much time do you spend listening to the radio every day? Listen, I, I encourage you, turn your radio off this week and pray all the way to work and pray all the way home in total silence and see what God could do in your life. You have not because you ask not. Spend some time in prayer. Let me give you this last one and I'm finished, we're done. I'm 45 seconds overdue, but we're almost there. He was the subject of a sad commentary. I guess here's the saddest part of this whole thing. I think about when Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, lovest thou me more than these? He said, he said your lips do me service, but your heart is far from me. And, and I guess the saddest part of this is we find the rich young ruler one time, but we never find him again. God is not obligated to come back and convict you again. You may only have one service, one time of conviction, and that's it. And you may damn your ever-living soul to hell by rejecting Christ today. You say, well, that's really serious. Yeah, it is serious. That's why I'm telling you. I would hate for anybody to go to hell off of a church pew, especially Highview Baptist Church. But Lord... This is what the Bible says they're going to say. We prophesied in your name and we did many wonderful works and we gave to the Christmas offering and we came to Sunday school and we listened to Pastor Mark and we even clapped a time or two when we didn't like it. Depart from me, I never knew you. Because here's what God will do. God will give you over to a reprobate mind. Romans chapter one. Now get this. I hate those books left behind because there's no youth pastor that's going to get saved after the rapture. He's gonna send strong delusion and you will believe a lie. That's what the Bible says. Don't, don't, don't get mad at me or Tim LaHaye. I'm sure a few people have gotten saved from that, but don't think and have confidence in the fact that I'll just wait till after the rapture and then I'll get saved. If you notice that we're gone and there will be a zombie apocalypse that's gonna take place because the Bible says man will try to kill themselves but death will flee from them. And people are gonna say, well, we saw it on TV. It's just now happening, night of the dead. I, I tell you what you need to do. If you're here after the rapture, you need to go get the mark of the beast as quick as you can. Because if those people will fight over TVs in Walmart, imagine how it's gonna be over food. You better go get the mark of the beast and you better just go along with it because you're already done. He says he gives them over to a reprobate mind. I used to play the guitar a little bit and I wasn't as good as all of our musicians here, but <clears throat> I learned to play in C, D, and plow handle G. I would take my thumb and reach over the top. They called that plow handle because I, I had big, long hands. And, 
and, and, and as long as it was in CD and G and everything Merle Haggard ever wrote was in CD or G, so I did pretty good. And so Hokey from Muskogee could be played in CD and G. I'm sorry, I'm Southern Baptist, I forgot. We can't talk about that. But, um, so, but I had a guitar that we couldn't get in tune. You can come, Miss Brittany. I couldn't get this guitar in tune. And so I took it to the music store and I had, and, and by the way, if you ever play the guitar here, I hate it when music groups come and they, they're getting ready to sing and they get up there and right before they go, down, 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 and they're like tune their guitar while we're watching. I'm like, do you not have a bus to tune your guitar on? That's just a pet peeve. That doesn't have anything to do with the sermon, but I took this guitar to the music store and he said, son, you'll never tune that guitar. It'll never be back in tune because the neck is warped. It's warped. It's twisted. When God gives you over to a reprobate mind, you're twisted and you'll never be back in tune with God again. He's done. This rich man went away sorrowful. He came serious. He came like many of you. Probably his heart was thumping just like yours. When he heard the words of Jesus, he knew what he needed to do. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He knew he needed to be saved. He knew those things in his life, but he held on. Some of you will hold on to a pew today. Some of you will hold on to a habit today. Some of you will hold on to a relationship today. Some of you are gonna trade Jesus for something. And what it ends up costing us is our eternity. It cost us everything. In just a minute, Pastor Luke's gonna come and he's gonna sing Lay My Isaac Down because I, I think we have some things in our life that we hold on to, that we make our God. And we need to give them up. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. With no one looking around, I, I wanna ask just a couple simple questions. With no one looking around, how many of you would say, Pastor Mark, I'm just not sure where I stand with God. I heard the sermon today and I'm, I'm just gonna be honest, I'm not sure if I died today that I would go to heaven. I, now, I'm not trying to put doubt in your mind. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you if you've got doubts because the Bible says these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So I'm, the first question I'm asking right out of the gate is how many of you, every head is bowed, every eye is closed, no one's looking around. How many of you would say, Pastor Mark, I am just not sure where I'm gonna spend eternity. Slip your hand up if that's you. I see one hand, two hands. Three hands, four hands, five hands, six hands. Thank you. Is there someone else that would join these? Just slip it up. Let me pray for you. You can slip it right back down. Thank you. I see that hand. You can put it down. Thank you. I see that hand. You can put it down. Is there someone else? God's not obligated to come back and convict you again. And if the God of this universe has passed by your way and spoken to your heart, Will you come today in just a moment and give your life to him? Here, here's, the, here's the second question I'm gonna ask. Maybe you're in a bad relationship. Maybe you've been in a bad relationship. Maybe your marriage is struggling. I don't know, but how many of you would say, Pastor Mark, my relationship with my spouse, my, my relationship, whether it's current spouse or previous spouse, but Pastor Mark, they're, they're, my marriage relationship, maybe it's a spouse to be, maybe you're single but about to get married. You say, Pastor Mark, there's some things that are not right and I need the Lord to work in my marriage today. I'm just gonna be honest, every head is bad. I'm not gonna come to you, I'm not gonna embarrass you, I'm not gonna come to you after church and go, hey, you need counseling. I wanna pray for you this morning. If you say, my marriage is not all it needs to be, Pastor Mark, pray for me. Would you slip your hand up if that's you around the building? There's lots of hands all over this building. Thank you, you can put them down. Probably 50 hands. Just a moment, this altar is for you. And if you're serious, you'll do like that rich young, you're ruler and you're, you're gonna run and get on your knees and say, Lord, help me. This is the last question. How many of you would just be honest and say, Pastor Mark, there's some things that's come in my life that's gotten too important, that's just gotten too important. And I know I need to let something go. God's telling me to let it go. If that's you, would you slip your hand up around the building today? Again, a host of hands. You can put them down. We're gonna give this invitation, which simply means we're gonna invite you to come and respond to the message that you've heard today.
whether it be your marriage, whether you need to come to Christ. If you need to accept Christ today as your personal Savior, I'm going to be standing right here at the front. Don't just come and pray. I want you to come to me and let us take the gospel and show you how you can know. If it's a lady, my wife will take her Bible and she'll show you how you can know the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand to our feet if you would. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Father God in heaven, I pray that you would work in this invitation now. I pray that you would have your way in this service. All this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If God's spoken to you, would you step out and come? Would you come? prayed for the day that God would give him a son and blessed Isaac was his name people are moving from all over the building a man just came in the great accepting Christ as his personal savior is that you do you need to come he'd ever know is your marriage worth making a 50-foot walk and falling on your face and saying Lord we need some help would you come